And so today we have the pleasure of hearing from John Gould. So John is a Royal Society Science Foundation, Ireland University Research Fellow and Associate Professor at Trinity College Dublin. He received his PhD from University College Cork and spent time at the Center for Quantum Technologies at the National University of Singapore. Then he undertook research at Oxford as a Marie Curie Fellow and worked as a UN research scientist at the Abdus Salam Center for Theoretical Physics, the ICTP, in Trieste, Italy. He's been at Trinity College Dublin since 2017. His group explores the intersections of quantum information, thermodynamics, and condensed matter. So please take it away. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, so 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 thanks, Nicole. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to, to give this seminar um, virtually. As I was saying the last time I was in Boston, and the first time I was actually in Boston was in 2017 for a nice um, quantum thermodynamics conference. And uh, I tried to sort of give a talk today, which is actually based on very recent work in that direction, but with a large oversection uh, with many body physics, which is really, you know, something close to my own, my own heart. Um, so um, just to give you a little bit of an idea of the type of things that we do in Dublin, um, so we have like, um, you know, I spent almost a decade abroad and I came back in say 2017 and uh, worked hard to start this research group and build it up. And this was actually the last group photograph that we took, which is 2019 already. So this is the, I mean, what you see in the background here is the Schrodinger uh, lecture hall in Trinity, which is uh, famous because it was the place that Schrodinger himself um, gave these influential lectures on what is life. Okay, Schrodinger was 30 years in, 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 in Dublin or so. And uh, as probably you've all experienced, I mean, physics nowadays looks very much like this, um, unfortunately. But we're managing, and what I'd like to tell you a little bit about just before I start are the types of topics that we explore in the group in case in normal times you want to pop around Dublin and, and, and discuss any of these things. So one of the, 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 the first topics that, that we explore in, in, in the group is the sort of uh, idea of the energetics of quantum information processing. So we're kind of living um, in the age of quantum simulation and uh, these devices, which are typically mesoscopic, they're noisy, connected to bats, et cetera. And we are actually very interested in how you can describe, you know, the sort of thermodynamic cost of processing information on these devices. So it's a kind of, connection of many body physics again with open systems theory, et cetera. I mean, the second topic is kind of the raw construction of a stochastic uh, quantum thermodynamics, which I know that Nicole's research uh, is very much involved in. And that's the idea that somehow, you know, often certain devices are very far away from the standard thermodynamic limit where you usually expect thermodynamics to apply. And then you will have sort of dominant fluctuations in the theory and you want to sort of construct a theory which is appropriate to describe very far from equilibrium phenomena. And the last topic is sort of extrapolating from the few to the many, and that's the notion of thermalization and transport in complex many body systems. So rather than looking in the domain of the few, really to taking the large end limit and seeing how thermal properties, thermodynamic properties, both equilibrium and non-equilibrium, you know, emerge from underlying quantum mechanical structure. So very much in the line of traditional quantum statistical mechanics. And that's gonna be this kind of topic of, of what I'm gonna talk about today. So just to summarize what I'll talk about. So um, the main hero of this particular work is Mark Mitchison, who's a postdoc in, in TCD. And uh, this was done in collaboration with Mar Marilyn Brennis, also a PhD student in Dublin. Archak Porte Asta was also a postdoc in Dublin and my old friend and colleague, Alessandro Silva in, 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 from CISA in Trieste. And I would say that uh, although I'm not speaking about it, many of the topics, the ideas that come in today's talk stem from previous discussions and work that we did along with Marilyn, with Marcus Regal in Penn State, who's an expert in thermalization and closed quantum systems. So I'm gonna give you a motivation and I'm gonna go right back to the 19th century for the kind of motivation uh, for, for what we wanna say. I'm going to give a pedagogical overview of eigenstate thermalization. I apologize if it's obvious to everybody, um, but it's somehow I have to give the talk like I've been recently learning it because it's a relatively new endeavor um, for me. And then discuss, you know, how you can do thermometry by by defasing defasing probes in in such scenarios, and, and and tell you a little bit about the results. 
So it's like super recent work. Um, it's literally put on the archive early last week. And it has this kind of, uh, you know, fairly striking title about taking the temperature of a pure quantum state. Um, and so I want to go straight into it and tell you where this motivation came about. And it actually came about in a period of time where by before the standard thermodynamics that we know today was even constructed. So, I mean, if you think about prior to thermodynamics, right, what was there? What did people think about when they thought about heat? There was something called the caloric theory, which was this kind of notion that heat was a sort of fluid that flowed from hot to cold. And uh, that was basically the sort of, uh, you know, dominant sort of idea about heat was right up until the middle of the 19th century. So an, earlier, an early dissenter of the theory was, was actually a person from Massachusetts, Benjamin Thompson or Count Rumford. And this guy was born in Massachusetts and then uh, had a very interesting life, fought in the loyalist side of the American Revolutionary War. And uh, then he ended up in Bavaria, in, in, in Munich, where he was tasked with reorganizing the Bavar Bavarian army. So he was very interested in sort of natural philosophy, okay? And what he noticed was when he went to the foundry in Munich, he noticed that when they were boring holes in cannon, okay, so making cannon guns, he noticed that an enormous amount of heat was generated by the process, right? So you must think that this was sort of unusual because at the time, again, it sort of hinted that it wasn't, I mean, that somehow there was this motion aspect to heat. And so what he did was he devised his own experiment whereby he sort of put, um, he immersed, he started boring a cannon, generating friction, and he immersed this cannon barrel in water. And he started to take the temperature as a function of time with his own thermometer, his own device. And to his amazement, if you read the original, um, you know, uh, paper in Philosophical Transactions, he noticed that after two and a half hours, the water in this device would boil without any flame, which at the time must have been amazing to passerby. You would have only seen water boil by means of a fire. Okay, and for, with that, he kind of concluded that maybe the caloric theory isn't the end of the story, that the only thing he can really sort of, um, the only thing that he could really, you know, conclude from this was that heat was actually a form of motion, okay? Which might seem obvious to us now, but at the time it wasn't. So about 50 years later, okay, Joule, James Joule, the famous one, um, well aware of Rumford's experiments, but still sort of, you know, very much in the depths of the caloric theory, he really nailed the issue by constructing this marvelous experiment, which is the dual paddle bucket experiment. So I would have seen this as an undergraduate um, and it's very simple. So what Jewel did, okay, is that he immersed basically as a bucket of water, okay. He has a paddle, which he can perform work, mechanical work on the water and measure that work by means of the change in height of a weight that was lifted. And he noticed that he could change the temperature just by doing this, right? And this was actually a kind of revolution, right? Because it was, it, he basically demonstrated the conservation of energy, okay? So it was the experiment which set the first law of thermodynamics as the conservation of energy. And the question that I'm gonna to ask today is, can I completely quantize this setup of Joule, the paddle bucket, really assuming nothing but time dependent Schrodinger equation, right? So can I really see this? emerging from a pure state scenario in quantum evolution. And I'd argue that I can, okay? So what are the three steps in Joule's experiment? Let's just analyze them and I'll take you through each one. <clears throat> the first one is that you need to perform work in thermal isolation. The second one is that obviously you want the fluid, whether it be water or mercury or whatever they were using at the time to relax okay, to reach thermal equilibrium. And then you need some sort of a device which plays the role of an in-situ thermometer, okay? You need these three components and that's the sort of dual paddle bucket experiment. So I wanna take the extreme limit now and I'm gonna think about the water as an isolated quantum many body system, okay? And the first thing you really need to think about is that, well, if I have an isolated quantum system, what do I even mean by thermalization? 
Okay, and that's a very old question because I'm not talking about connecting that many body system to an external path. I'm really talking about taking that system out of equilibrium and basically allowing it for it to relax and looking locally and seeing, you know, those thermodynamics emerge locally. And this is a question that was really asked even uh, in the inception of quantum theory by people like Schrodinger and von Neumann, right? It was a kind of academic question because there's always some bath, but I think where this came, you know, really became really important again is in the field of ultra cold atom physics where pioneering experiments now can observe coherent dynamics over you know, time scales, which would typically be unprecedented in condensed matter physics, time scales so long whereby the system following some non-equilibrium manipulation can reach thermal equilibrium locally, okay? So the first such experiment that sort of opened up the door of these questions was an experiment that actually showed that thermal, uh, thermalization does not occur. So this was in uh, David Weiss's group in Penn State about 15 years ago, whereby uh, a one dimensional quantum gas, so at extremely low temperatures, was taken out of equilibrium by means of a Bragg pulse and then allowed to collide thousands of times. And what they noticed when they measured the momentum distribution at long times is that it wasn't actually thermal. And this, the reason for this is that the system simulates an integrable Hamiltonian, right? So it's a special system with an extensive set of conserved quantities, okay, which are preventing thermalization to occur. And there's many examples now where you can break this integrability fairly easily and even controllably break it. So I'm just mentioning one, but there's tons of experiments that look at thermalization of observables. For example, there's this dipolar version of the newton Creighton experiment um, whereby a magnetic field can sort of tune the system away from integrability and you can observe kind of thermalization, inter intrinsic thermalization at the level of observables. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take you through pedagogically what I explicitly mean by thermalization in a closed quantum system. So imagine I have some uh, Hamiltonian, which describes a many body quantum system. And let's assume that I have no degeneracies and the system is large. So it's in the large end limit. Okay. Imagine I take some initial state, which is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So that is going to be, let's just say for argument's sake, we have a spin chain and my initial state is a computational basis state, okay? And that's gonna be some superposition in the energy eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian, okay? The other assumption that I'm gonna make, okay, is that uh, this, the, the state will have an extensive energy, will scale like N, which is a reasonable assumption in a many body system. And the fluctuations, okay, of my initial state are going to be sub-extensive. So in other words, if I plot the overlaps between my initial state and the energy eigenbasis, I'm going to get some distribution which is narrow. But the most, the key point here is that the distribution of energy of the initial state in the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian should be a peaked function in the thermodynamic limit. That's the assumption. And then what you do is once that initial state is prepared by means of you know, uh, some magnetic field, or it could be a quench or whatever, you just allow the system to evolve freely under the Hamiltonian, right? So it becomes some big superposition in the energy eigenbasis with phases given to you by the energy eigenvalues. In time, what happens is that initial product state will become entangled. So you're gonna get entanglement growing up, leading to some volume-like behavior, okay? And if you look at some observable, as a function of time, some local observable, what you'll actually see independent of whether or not the system is integrable, chaotic or whatever, is you're gonna see that observable relax in the long time limit. So that's a kind of equilibration of the observable and it equilibrates to its time average value, okay? So if I take this O average where it's equilibrating to, it's just the time average of this signal, okay? So this is a particular. So what is this exp what is this time average uh, object? This time average observable. Well, mathematically, you know what you can see is that if I time average the expectation value, then I'm going to wash away the phases, and I'm left with just this term in the diagonal. Okay, and uh, that's basically you can write that as the expectation value of the observable in a particular ensemble, which is called the diagonal ensemble, 
which is basically a mixed quantum state in the energy eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian, whose eigenbasis are the overlap squared. Okay, so that's the diagonal ensemble. And the question when I say, does a system thermalize? The question that you ask is, does the expectation value of the observable in the diagonal ensemble, is that approximately equivalent to the expectation value of the observable in the microcanonical ensemble? Okay, and when does this happen generically? So the answer to this question, okay, one answer to this question is if my Hamiltonian fulfills something called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is an ansatz on how the matrix elements of the observable behave in the energy eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian, okay? And this was sort of proposed by Mark Sredigny building on previous work by Michael Berry and Deutsch and other people. Um, and essentially what, it's, what it says or what it, the ansatz is, is that if my system is to thermalize, then the matrix elements of the observable, the diagonal ones, should become a smooth function of the average energy defined like this. And the off diagonal matrix elements should be exponentially small in the system size. So they're weighted by this e to the minus s, where s is an entropy, statistical entropy. And then what's going to be very important later on is that you also have a smooth function in the off diagonals called f and some random variable, which is zero mean and unit variance. This is what the ansatz is. Now, why does this explain thermalization if you have this thing? Um, well, if you take the diagonal ensemble, okay, you get that anyway, just from time averaging your dynamics, because the ETH has that the diagonal matrix elements are smooth function of the energy, then what I can do is I can tailor expand around the mean energy, okay? So I tailor expand uh, the matrix elements, the diagonal matrix elements around the mean energy, I have a sum over CN squared that I'm missing here, apologies. So this would mean you'd get a zero here. And I'm left with just something, which is that smooth function of the energy plus some term in the variance of the Hamiltonian and the second derivative of the observable with respect to the energy E, okay? So what you can do is you can see that, well, this is very close to what the microcanonical ensemble should be. And if you think about it, d squared, the variance of the energy is something which scales like n, and the second derivative with respect to the energy scales like one over n squared. So this fluctuation term is one over n. So in the thermodynamic limit, I really can say that the, you know, that the time average, okay, is equivalent to the, you know, to the to the observable evaluated on an eigenstate on a single eigenstate in the thermodynamic limit okay so up to some sub extensive correction the other thing you need to show for thermalization is that the actual time evolution must also remain close to the average for most time so if i look at the fluctuations of the observable in time about the time average value what i can do with some basic mathematics and the eth and that's with the knowledge that the off diagonal matrix elements are exponentially small in the system size is I can bound these temporal fluctuations by something, you know, which is basically decaying exponentially with n. So not only do you, uh, you, you, you reach on average the, the, the sort of microcanonical or eigenstate expectation value, the fluctuations about the time average value are also becoming extremely small, okay? But there's more, and the last part that I need as a prerequisite for what I'm gonna tell you about is something which is not often discussed, which is the behavior of the off diagonal matrix elements, which are exponentially decaying uh, with system size. So what information, if you can fish these out of your system, do, do these give you, okay? So they actually control the correlation function. So if I think about fluctuations of an observable on a given energy eigenstate, it's not too much work to show that they're actually connected to the smooth function, which appears in the off diagonal matrix elements of the ETH. Furthermore, and what's going to be used in our, in, in this presentation, is that it's crucial to realize that not only does the ETH govern one point observables, it also dictates the behavior of two point observables. So the standard sort of response functions of condensed matter physics 
you know, can be evaluated on a single eigenstate. And what you can see of the sub-extensive corrections, again, is the famous fluctuation dissipation theorem actually holds at the level of a single eigenstate. So not only does the ETH govern the behavior of observables, it also governs the thermal, it also explains how you can get thermalization occurring at the level of two-point functions, okay? And that's going to be pretty crucial. So I just want to give one slide on how you can actually extract this uh, smooth function of the energy. So what you do essentially is nothing more than a large scale exact diagonalization of your Hamiltonian. You have some powerful computer, you extract the matrix elements of some observable in the energy eigenbasis. And what you realize is that you can extract the matrix elements by looking at the mod of ONM squared in a certain frequency bin and restricting to sum all over the elements in that bin at each frequency. So you fix the average and you vary omega, and at each omega, you perform this coarse graining. And that allows you to extract mod F squared up to some energy dependent prefactor, which you can work out. So numerically, you can get this. It's tricky. You have to sift through gajillions of matrix elements, but you can get the smooth function. I'm going to give you an example of that in just a second. Okay. <clears throat> so for the purpose of the rest of the talk, it's always good to have an example after that particular sort of foray into kind of the, the ETH. And uh, the example that you should have in mind is pretty simple. So what we have is an XXC spin chain. So it's a bunch of interacting spins, which in and of itself is a paradigmatic integrable system. And integrability is broken by adding a staggered magnetic field in the Z direction to the many body system, okay? So this term is known to break the integrability. And if there's any other latent symmetry around the place, we break that by a sort of hand, okay? So we're able to do full diagonalization of this system up to fairly large system size. You can see there's a large Hilbert space dimension. And we literally just get the matrix elements by brute force exact diagonalization. So how do, how, how, do the, how do these matrix elements look? So the first thing we want to do is we want to check does the ETH hold. So this is a particular observable. It's actually a sum of an observable with some envelope function, but it doesn't really matter for what I'm trying to get, get, get across. And you can see that indeed, if you scatter plot the diagonal matrix elements, they're becoming a smooth function of the energy as you increase the system size. And you can see that this black line here is the microcanonical prediction. So what you would see is that if you start increasing the system size, all of those matrix elements are going to lie on a line in the thermodynamic limit, which is the microcanonical prediction. The other thing which is a bit technical is that the eigenstate to eigenstate fluctuations decay exponentially with L, which is also a signature. It's often called the weak signature of ETH. The other thing I will say, if, if you have ensemble equivalence, you can actually show that the ETH prediction, namely the expectation value on an eigenstate with energy E, you can work out what the canonical equivalent is, and you can compare your prediction for the, the expectation value of the observable in that eigenstate with the corresponding canonical prediction. And you can see for a particular observable local magnetization at the center of the chain, at least for sufficiently decent temperatures, there's a beautiful agreement that only gets better as you increase the system size. So often people ask, why does it start to mess up at lower temperatures? This is not unexpected because the ETH works best in finite size systems away from the edges of the spectrum, okay, because of finite size effects. All right. The next thing is the off diagonal matrix elements. So you, in this system, you can extract it by the procedure that I just described. So what you see here on a semi-log plot, okay, are matrix elements, off-diagonal matrix elements, and the black line is the coarse-grained average, which actually is the mod F squared, okay? And you can use this extraction of correlation functions, or sorry, extraction of mod F squared, to show that you can actually accurately reproduce the correlation functions in the model on a single eigenstate. So you can compare, for instance, here, you know, a calculation done on a canonical state for a correlation function with the equivalent expectation value on a single eigenstate, and you see you get very good agreement, okay? So this comes from another paper that I'm not going to talk about. So the bottom line about this part is that essentially, look, you can extract a lot of information from off-diagonal matrix elements, 
and the information that you get is connected to the correlation functions of the model in thermal equilibrium. Okay, so that's that's the the, the first part. The, the next part I want to say is that, look, if I plot as a function of the energy, which is equivalent to temperature, so energy is close to the center of the spectrum, okay, are high temperatures. So what you see <coughs> is that if I plot different energies, you see that it's actually the low frequencies here, which are really sort of varying with the temperature, while at higher frequencies, you don't really see much variance in, in, in the temperature. And that's going to be the sort of building block of what comes next. So it's important to point out that low frequencies, basically mod F squared has significant variance with temperature. This is going to be the basis of the thermometry scheme that I'm going to show. The other thing I want to point out is that people have been studying the low frequency behavior of mod F squared in the context of ETH only quite recently. So some of the work we did with Marcus Regal, also in the group of Anatoly Polkovnikov there in Boston, are very interested in looking at the omega going to zero behavior of mod F squared as a diagnostic for quantum chaos, okay? So this is gonna be very important for what's next. So I hope I've convinced you at least in the first part, okay, that I can legitimately have an isolated quantum system that could thermalize if it fulfills the ETH, okay? So now let's go back to the dual paddle bucket. Let's go to the first step, okay? So the first thing we want to do is we want to perform more, we want to perform some mechanical work on this isolated quantum system. And I'm going to do that just by doing periodic driving of that spin chain model in the staggered field that I just showed you by just modulating some spin at the center of the chain, okay? That's the, the, the numerical experiment that I'm going to do. So if you do that, okay, and you assume that the system, the only conserved quantity now is the, sorry, I said, I said something wrong. I mean, if I look at the average energy as a function of time, when I'm applying the drive, you see that it increases. But the most important thing that you can see is that the energy fluctuations are actually, the relative energy fluctuations are decreasing. So if you want, I'm performing work I'm pumping energy into this isolated spin chain. And that the analogy of that is just the paddle, right? That you will have, the stirring the water, okay? And now what this allows us to do, what's nice about it, right? Is that I can use this procedure, you say, either in a numerical experiment or in an actual experiment to stop, okay? I just stop paddling or driving, okay? And I get a preparation, right? I'm gonna get some state, Okay, which is a highly non-equilibrium state. And this is plotted here. This is for 27 spins, so it's a massive numerical calculation. Uh, we do this by means of something called the kernel polynomial method, but it's not particularly important for what follows. The point is that I have a controllable way to set the average energy of a preparation and make a non-equilibrium uh, initial condition. You could say I do this a different way. I could just quench the system by abruptly changing a Hamiltonian parameter, that's fine too. But what's nice about this is that I can control over time the energy density and hence I can set the temperature at which the system will eventually equilibrate to, okay? So the non-equilibrium preparation is set, okay? By me basically stopping the driving at a certain time t, okay? Is that clear to everybody before I move on what I'm doing? Okay. Uh, it, it just interrupt me if it's not clear. Uh, the next thing you want to do, so that's that's taken care of. I perform my mechanical work, okay? The next thing, of course, that we have to do is we have to wait for the system to re-equilibrate and hopefully terminalize, right? And uh, this, I think, is a really uh, nice example of the ETH in action. Um, so what you have here, okay, is now I plot an observable as a function of time after that preparation step. So these different colors correspond to different preparations, okay? So different amounts of energy that I've pumped into the system. And what you can see <coughs> is that the observable actually, when you stop driving, it equilibrates pretty rapidly, right? You can see that it, you know, it, it equilibrates to something. And we're gonna ask what that is in a second, right? The other thing you can do is you can just do a brute force numerical simulation of a given correlation function of the observable. 
And you can see after some time scale following the preparation that the correlation function decays, meaning the system has relaxed, okay? Now the question is, does the system reach a new temperature, okay, in the long time limit after the driving, which is set by the energy density of the initial condition? And the answer is yes. So what you see here is the, is the time average value of this observable. I just time average the signal, okay, at different E averages corresponding to different preparations of, of my drive. So the longer I paddle, the more energy I put in, okay? And the, the blue line is the microcanonical prediction computed from another technique. So a finite time average. And you can see that you have a beautiful agreement between microcanonical statistical mechanics, okay, and the time average of your dynamics here. And this tells me that the system is thermalizing with, to an energy, you know, to an energy set by the energy in the initial preparation, okay? So it's a very beautiful example of thermalization in a large many body system. And I can go a little bit further. I can also look at to see if the correlation functions are also behaving in the same way. So if I plot, for example, the low frequency um, part of the division between the susceptibility and, and the noise correlations, I can basically show that I get a very good agreement with the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So there is no question, at least in this numerical experiment, that after I stir and I wait, the system relaxes to a new energy, to a new, to a new thermal equilibrium at a temperature which is set by the amount of time that I actually drive the system to, okay? That's, that's the next step. The last part of the dual paddle bucket experiment is to be able to take the temperature. And remember, so far in this numerical experiment, I've done nothing really, only solved the time-dependent Schrodinger equation in this many-body system. I have not yet, I mean, this temperature is emerging internally because the system internally is equilibrating, okay? And I wanna keep that pure state character, okay? So how would I do that? So there's various different ways you could imagine measuring the temperature of an isolated system. And my suggestion now is we're gonna do something that keeps the whole thing quantum, very quantum, okay? So we really want to make something which is not really a classical thermometer, but really a quantum thermometer. And it'll become very clear what happens uh, next. So what I'm gonna do, okay, is I'm going to assume that in the background, okay, while this whole experiment is taking place, this driving of the many body system, this waiting for thermal relaxation, there lies about an ancillary uh, qubit, okay? And that ancillary qubit has got an interaction Hamiltonian, which is pretty particular, but it's not uh, unusual, for example, in cold atoms to engineer, which is that when the qubit is excited, it interacts with the many body system, but when it's in the down state, it's just transparent. So it only kicks the many body system when it's flipped into the up state, okay? And that uh, interaction Hamiltonian commutes with the Hamiltonian of the qubit, and this means you have a type of pure dephasing interaction. So the probe interacts with the many body system. And what it actually does is it generates an entangled state between your qubit probe, which is now going to play the role of a thermometer and the many body system. So after you put in a pi over two pulse, meaning a Hadamard operation on the qubit, what you see, the system evolves into an entangled state between the qubit and the probe. And I mean, I would perform this Hadamard operation after the system relaxes, okay? So really not at the start, but I wait for the many body system to relax. And then I, I put in a Hadamard operation to my thermometer qubit, and then I, I get this entangled state, okay? So I stir, I wait, okay? I wait for relaxation, and now I switch on a Hadamard gate and I get this entangled state between the qubit and the many body system. And what happens now is, of course, because of that interaction uh, between the qubit and the many body system, uh, if I trace out the many body system, the qubit decoheres, okay? It, it decoheres in the presence of the many body environment. And uh, this is very easy to work out how it decoheres. It decoheres in a way in which, um, you know, which is dictated by the following function okay, which is often called a survival probability. So if you want, it's the fidelity between 
your state where the you've turned on this sort of interaction, okay, and the state where whereby you haven't, okay. So it's a it's an overlap function, and this can be measured in the lab, okay. It can be measured in by a Ramsey interferom interferometric sequence, um, and the, and the way you do that is that you apply a second pi over two pulse to the qubit with a phase theta relative to the first, and then you measure the probability of the qubit to be in the excited state. And by varying that phase, what you can do is you can extract the decoherence function, okay? And that's very general, you can always do that. So here's the thing, I'm making another assumption. I'm going to assume now that my qubit, okay, is weakly coupling to the many body system. So it, it has a small interaction strength. And if you assume that, what you can do mathematically is you can take the decoherence function and you can perform a cumulant expansion of the second order into the direction term, okay? And what you get is you get a term which looks like this, which depends on S of omega, which of course is a correlation function in frequency space, okay? And what you realize if you take the long time limit beyond the sort of typical relaxation time for correlation functions is that you can work out analytically in this perturbative way that you get exponential decay in the qubit. And I just want to pause there to say that for me, at least, this is still highly uh, non-trivial because my bath is really a pure quantum state of a strongly correlated system and I'm making quite a strong statement here. I'm saying that if I have a qubit weakly coupled to it at long times, the decay of that qubit will be exponential in time, okay? With, with a rate which now depends on the omega going to zero behavior of the correlation function. So in other words, the exponent of decay at long times of the qubit depends on the zero frequency behavior of mod f squared if you assume the ETH holds, okay? And if you track your mind back, I showed you that the low frequency um, limit of the correlation function is very sensitive to temperature. Now this is going to be the sort of idea that I'm probing the temperature, okay? Of this sort of pure state dual bucket type experiment, right? By means of entangling a qubit to this many body system. So how does it stack up? How does this weak coupling approximation stack up to a, say, brute force evaluation of the dynamics? So <clears throat> what you see here, the solid lines are different, uh, you know, different uh, exact, numerically exact calculations of the decoherence function. And the dashed lines are our weak coupling approximation on a semi-log plot, right? So you see that this very well describes this behavior for this weak coupling, okay? The second thing is that rather than thinking about decoherence, <coughs> you can say that <coughs> the qubit is really becoming entangled with the environment, and it's quite straightforward to extract how the entanglement of the qubit in the presence of the, of the environment depends on the temperature. So you can see that these different colors are different temperatures, and the qubit is basically getting a different rate of entanglement generation depending on the temperature, okay? Um, I should point out that again, we are the qubit is not thermalizing because of by virtue of the interaction that we that we um, chose. So we chose a specific form of interaction between the qubit and the many body system, which is such that the interaction Hamiltonian commutes with the, the qubit Hamiltonian, and therefore in the asymptotic limit you get a maximally entangled state with a rate which basically is governed again by the low frequency behavior of mod f squared in the ETH, right? So if you plot now this exponent versus the average energy, you can see that it's a linear function of the average energy. And then if you plot it versus temperature, you see it has this type of behavior. So there's a very nice sort of uh, temperature dependence on the exponent, which then is the basis of our thermometer. Now you might say at this point, that's all very nice, very interesting, I hope, um, but you know, ultimately a thermometer should be sort of something, you know, which has some behavior that you can a priori before you do your experiment trust. For instance, you know that like, you know, for instance, mercury expands when you heat it in a certain way, linearly, whatever it is. 
Okay, and this is certainly, you know, to me, it doesn't seem, at least in this particular case, that this would not be observable or system independent, right? However, what I would say in, in, you know, in general is that, well, there's two things. Before I get on to making a general statement, I just want to say that if you, if you like, this is a type of Schrodinger's thermometer, okay? Because I'm really exploiting entanglement between a microscopic degree of freedom and a macroscopic degree of freedom, totally in a pure state. And what's really amazing to me as a thermodynamist is that I get this, you know, sort of really realization of the dual pile bucket experiment at the level of just time evolving the Schrodinger equation, right? So it's, for me, it's kind of remarkable that that's the case, that you get thermodynamics coming out of a coarse graining of the, but it, you know, much more than just thermalization, you can really see that you're converting mechanical work into heat, which manifests itself in a temperature change, et cetera. And I think it would be a very nice thing to, to demonstrate. But, you know, the problem is with this particular thing is that, you know, in the end, you know, that it seems that mod f squared as omega goes to zero doesn't have any particular, you know, universal functional form as a function of temperature that you can actually um, exploit. But at least we have an argument in higher dimensions. We don't have um, numerical data because it's too difficult to do good numerics in three dimensions. But what we could, what I quite can say from a hydrodynamic argument based on an old paper by Kadanoff and Martin is that in three dimensions, okay, you expect the chi double prime of omega, the imaginary part of the, of the uh, susceptibility to scale like omega, okay? And if you go through the details, okay, I'm running out of time now, but if you go through the details that are in the paper, what you can argue is if you have a three-dimensional system, okay, where you know the temperature dependence of the diffusion coefficient and the uh, static susceptibility, there's a kind of linear scale for this exponent, which could be exploited to do a highly novel quantum thermometry in a system in higher dimensions, which shows diffusion, okay? There's some subtleties in one dimension regarding the thermodynamic limit. I don't want to get, in, get into them now. I'm more than happy to talk about it with anybody afterwards. But I mean, it's beside the point because what I think I hope I demonstrated or convinced you that the mechanical equivalent of heat experiment from Joule, okay, which is probably one of the most important physics experiments of the 19th century, can be re-expressed totally in the language of pure state thermodynamics, right? So Ali, if you assume ETH, that's basically all you need. Um, I hope I gave you a convincing in silico experiment. Um, and I think the key point here, and I think the foundational question that this raises for thermodynamics is that if you accept that generically systems that are not special, like they're not many body localized, they're not integrable, generically fulfill the ETH, do we actually really need ensembles at all? I never referred to this temperature being set by some ensemble. I mean, it really is set by the energy of the initial condition and everything is got from, you know, the start of evolution of a pure state. And the other nice feature, which I find novel, I have no idea if it's more useful than another way of doing thermometry, but at least it's, it's interesting from a foundational perspective is that this thermometer is really quantum in the sense that it, it works on quantum interference. So you look at the, you know, the, the temperature dependence of, 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 of Ramsey fringes, um, which gives you essentially the rate of entanglement generation between your qubit probe and your many body system. So with that, that's all I have to say to you. I hope that it encourages you to read the paper. If, if, if you can uh, give us some feedback would be nice. We're very excited about it. It was a very um, sort of, it was a project that required a lot of different things. Um, so Mark Mitchison really did a great job in leading it. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say thanks and I'm happy to discuss with anybody. Thank you. Thanks very much for the talk. I very much liked the clear parallel between the experiment during the 1800s and what we can potentially do with a quantum system today. Does mm -hmm. anybody have any questions for John? Maybe a naive question, like in the beginning, like you said, you uh, pump energy into the system, but that somehow makes sense to me in the pedal bucket experiment. But 
with the quantum analog, can you uh, be sure that you not also extract energy at some point? Yeah, that, that, that's an excellent question. And this is something that I guess uh, Nicole would be interested in as well. And I didn't really, I mean, she probably um, picked it up already, but uh, let me just see if I can find the, the right slide. Um, no, it's this one, where is the, yeah. So, so maybe I, I went a bit too fast. So, um, so look, I mean, I just use a slight different terminology, which is more familiar in the in the many body physics domain. But I mean, one thing that I I, I, talk, I I can tell you is that we performed work on this system and preparing the many body system in the ground state. So the ground state in quantum thermodynamics is a passive state, right? So I mean, I can only really perform work in that way on average, right? So I, I only give energy into the system. Number two, what we call the energy distribution here is actually the work distribution. It's exactly the same thing mathematically. So from quantum thermodynamics, you like to kind of, you know, you like to define, you know, the fact that work is not really an observable. It's, you know, it's something that, you know, you, you, you get from taking two time measurements of, of, of the energy, but this energy distribution that's used to describe the preparation is the work distribution that at a given time, so if I stop my, if I stop my, um, if I stop my, my, my drive at some preparation time, that gives me an energy of say minus eight J, and this would be the work distribution up to that time. If I stopped it somewhere else, I'll get a different distribution. Um, so this is, these are based, this is a huge calculation, right? You have 10 million Hilbert space dimension. Um, so everything is smoothing out because really there's very low gaps in the system, uh, et cetera. And it's just following, the peaks are following the drive. So, I mean, you know, this is something actually that's interesting. I talked with Chris Jarzinski just uh, last week about it. So he's studying very similar things uh, classically at the moment where you're doing periodic driving. Um, and actually the universal form of these distributions in chaotic systems I mean, there's a famous work by Paul Kovnikov and others on it, you know, from a few years ago, but I don't think there's a consensus on exactly what the distribution should be. Um, we call it a microwave chicken state. And the reason for that is because in this paper by Paul Kovnikov, he compares the situation of microwaving a chicken to putting a chicken in the oven, right? So it's very different. In a microwave, you really turn on some periodic drive in isolation whereby in an oven, you really bring something in contact with another bath. Like, so here you're really doing the mechanical equivalent, right? So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting in its own right. Cool, thanks. I had a question about the Ancilla qubit. That, yeah. that um, using an Ancilla qubit in that sense um, makes a lot of sense. It's such a qubit has been, used for other purposes uh, to be in contact with many body systems and other um, equilibration related experiments. But in those experiments, often the amount of time for which the ancilla needs to remain um, non decohered not decohered by yeah. the undesirable part of its environment yeah. is problem problematic and that the ancilla seems really to be the, the weak point of these, yeah, those experiments. Yeah. So how yeah. long does your qubit need to be yeah, uh, is, not entangling with the undesirable environment. Yeah, I mean, so this is a, this is a good question. I mean, and the answer is sort of, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't really know because it's so generic what we're proposing here in some sense, I wouldn't be able to give you, what you're asking about is what's natural T2 time and is it enough for you to get phase information, et cetera. I mean, the answer is that we think it should be but I mean, this type of Ramsey sequences and say ultra cold atoms has been done, right? So for example, people have extracted decoherence function of impurities embedded in, in, in ultra cold atom systems, but typically you have more than one impurity. So you have to average over an ensemble of impurities, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I'd be, I mean, I'd be lying to you if I could give you specific numbers there um, for how long you need to do, you need to keep everything kind of, kind of kosher for you to extract the information. I mean, it would be very much dependent on the system, the heating rate that you have, like in cold atoms, I think there's probably enough time. If you look at the time scales there, you know, in some of the modern experiments, they're really huge in comparison to kind of, I mean, the coherent time scales of the problem are really large, right? So, 
I mean, natural heating doesn't kick in in an insulator state to order of seconds, right? So it's really massive uh, in comparison to the, you know, the time scale needed to run this whole experiment. So I don't think it's beyond the realm of what's possible. Um, we didn't sort of focus too much on implementation in, you know, in a particular experimental setup, analyzing the noise and all that stuff, because we really were trying to focus on you know, sort of foundational aspect of taking the extreme kind of uh, pure state quantum thermodynamics approach and showing that you have all of the components to do a kind of foundational experiment in classical thermodynamics, the analog. So, I mean, Nicole, I, I, we could work it out, but uh, we didn't really look into the fine details. Okay, yeah, and it would depend on the platform. That makes sense. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, then thanks very much again for the talk and thanks, thanks for joining us. Cheers. Um, um, any of you, if you want to come around in Dublin sometime, just, just let me know. Thanks. <laughs> Soon. See you later. Bye.